One year ago today, supporters of the far-right election-denying um, former president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, stormed the Brazilian Congress and Supreme Court and presidential offices. They rioted. They violently tried to overturn the results of the election in which their hero, President Jair Bolsonaro, had been voted out of office. That was one year ago today. And here today is New York Times Brazil bureau chief, Jack Nikas, um, writing about that parallel experience. He said, quote, there were two shocking attacks on the Western Hemisphere's two largest democracies, both broadcast around the world and both prompted by presidents who had questioned their legitimate election losses. Each posed an extraordinary test of the country's democracy, and each raised the question of how a deeply polarized society would move forward in the wake of such an assault. With time, the answer to that question is becoming clear. The parallel attacks have had nearly opposite aftermaths. In the United States, support is soaring for Donald J. Trump's campaign to retake the White House as he frames his 2020 election loss as the real insurrection and January 6th as a, quote, beautiful day. At the same time, his counterpart in Brazil, the far right former president Jair Bolsonaro, has quickly faded into political irrelevance. Six months after he left office last year, electoral officials barred him from running again until 2030. And many right-wing leaders have shunned him. Why have there been such contrasting reactions to such similar threats? Researchers and analysts point to a multitude of reasons, including the country's differing political systems, media landscapes, national histories, and judicial responses. But one difference especially stands out. Stephen Levitsky, a Harvard professor of government, co-author of the book How Democracies Die, who has studied both the American and Brazilian democracies, says that leaders on Brazil's right, quote, publicly, clearly, unambiguously accepted the results of the election and did exactly what democratic politicians are supposed to do. He says, quote, that is strikingly different from how Republicans responded in the United States. Jair Bolsonaro and Trump both stoked their supporters into a violent effort to seize power by force after losing an election. Bolsonaro has since become totally irrelevant in politics in Brazil while Trump is still at the head of the Republican Party in the United States and is poised to become the party's nominee for president again. Now, part of that is, yes, that a Brazilian court ruled that Bolsonaro cannot run for office again until 2030. He is disqualified from politics for the time being because of what he did. For Trump in this country, it's an open question as to whether he might face the same kind of disqualification. The super conservative U.S. Supreme Court will take up that question just one month from today on February 8th. So it's, it's, it's partly a matter of whether or not there's a judicial penalty for effectively waging war against your own country's democracy. But it's also a matter of how Republicans, how the party, how American Republican leaders have reacted to this violence from their own leader, how they have reacted to this anti-democratic turn in the leadership of their party. It is not just a Trump problem. It's that Republicans like what Trump did, and they don't mind the idea of him doing it again. Republican members of Congress and U.S. senators still voted to throw out the results of the 2020 election the night after the violent attack on Congress in January 2021. Even today, polls in Iowa ahead of next week's caucuses show that, that Trump's pledge to root out his enemies like vermin, claims like that make Iowa Republican voters more likely to vote for him, not less. When Trump was criticized for saying that immigrants are poisoning the blood of America, when he was criticized for that because that's literally what Adolf Hitler said about non-Aryans in Mein Kampf, that claim from Trump polled so well among Republicans and was so well received among Republican voters that he not only has kept using that same language over and over again, he's now sort of institutionalizing it. Today, the new anti-Nikki Haley ad that the Trump Super PAC put up is an anti-immigrant ad that is titled Poisoning to remind people that Trump has adopted that Hitler phraseology. Republicans like this stuff. In Brazil, the right did not like this stuff. And they rejected Jair Bolsonaro's efforts to stay in power by force. And that now means that Bolsonaro is exiled and irrelevant. 
But where did Bolsonaro exile to? Where did he go when he fled Brazil, fearing prosecution? He fled to Florida, to Ron DeSantis's Florida, where, as if the point wasn't clear enough, pro-Trump Republican groups have greeted him like a hero. Ladies and gentlemen, get on your feet and join me in welcoming President Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro greeted with a hero's welcome at the pro-Trump Turning Point USA Florida event in Orlando. He loves them, they love him. Bolsonaro rejected in his own country, rejected by the right wing in his own country for his effort to violently overthrow the second largest democracy in the Western Hemisphere. He is celebrated by the Republican right wing in this country, rejected in his own country, celebrated by our right wingers where the effort to violently overthrow the largest democracy in the Western Hemisphere, us, has just been taking a three-year breather, and they're going to put up the guy who tried it again. It is not a Trump problem. It's a Republican Party problem. This is what they want. Other right-wingers who have charismatic leaders like Trump around the world don't necessarily get behind them when they try violence to stay in power. Our Republicans do. And so this is how we get to the first two speeches of the President Joe Biden re-election effort in 2024. Friday at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania and today at the Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. The two kickoff speeches of his 2024 re-election campaign, speeches about our status as a democracy, the fight to establish ourselves as a democracy in the Revolutionary War, the fight to keep our democracy in the Civil War, the threat to end democracy today posed by the Republican Party and Trump. And I don't know, I don't have insider information, but I doubt this is the ground on which the Biden campaign hoped to be making its case for re-election. They have other things they want to talk about. Like Nancy Pelosi was just describing with Jen Psaki in her exclusive interview tonight. They want to talk about kitchen table issues. Right? And they have a lot to talk about. The unemployment rate has been below 4%, below 4% for nearly two straight years. That means this is the best jobs market in America since the 1960s. Jobs numbers under President Joe Biden are better than every single year of job numbers under President Donald Trump, including the years that Trump says were the best economic years ever. Actually, no, Joe Biden's are better. The uninsured rate is the lowest in American history. For the last full quarter, we have numbers for the annual economic growth rate in this country was 5.2 percent, which is an impossibly high number. Remember when all the economists said there was going to be a recession in 2023? How about 5.2 percent annual growth rate instead? Prices are coming down, including gas prices. Wages are going up. Under Joe Biden, the United States is doing better than every single other major economy in the world since COVID. Fighting against Republicans every step of the way, Joe Biden has zeroed out or reduced student loan monthly payments for tens of millions of Americans with crushing student loan debt. I mean, you talk about a contrast with the Republican Party. Joe Biden has reduced or zeroed out student loan payments for tens of millions of Americans and has fought to do it for more. What's the Republican idea? that Joe Biden would love to be running against on that subject? Well, hit it, Governor DeSantis. Let's hear from you. The reality is we've had a generation of students go deep into debt, and some of them end up with degrees in things like zombie studies, which are just not making a difference. A lot of these degrees have not given people a pathway to success, and it's caused them to be deep in debt. So what are you going to do about that? Student loans should be dischargeable in bankruptcy. First of all, y'all majored in terrible things, and so you deserve it. But also, you know, okay, if you've got terrible debt, behold the Republican plan for student debt. Declare bankruptcy, you guys. Hey, students, declare bankruptcy. That will set you up for success. That's how Republicans think you should deal with high student debt. You're not going to get any help from us. Just declare yourself bankrupt, personally. The Biden campaign, I'm sure, would love to be running on that. 
In Iowa this week, ahead of the caucuses, one week from today, the Trump campaign has scheduled an event with Republican Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. What is Sarah Huckabee Sanders famous for since she stopped being the Trump White House spokesperson? Well, as governor, she has distinguished herself by repealing child labor laws. Okay, because who among us doesn't think there isn't anything wrong with America that can't be fixed by chaining a few more children to the looms like we used to do in the good old days? The Biden campaign, I'm sure, would love to be running on issues like that. On the issue of abortion rights. As of tonight, we are seeing the first news reporting from The New Yorker about the first American woman who may have died in Texas because of the Republicans' abortion ban there. Her name was Yenny Glick. She was married. It was a high-risk pregnancy. Four outside experts who reviewed her medical file after her death have all concluded that when the life-threatening complications started in her high-risk pregnancy, had she been offered an abortion, it, quote, probably would have saved her life. She died. The United States Supreme Court, dominated by Republican appointees, has just allowed Republican-controlled Idaho state government to reinstate its new abortion ban, which threatens doctors with five years in prison if they perform an abortion in the case of a medical emergency threatening the health of a woman. They are letting that go into effect in Idaho while the court considers Idaho overall, Idaho's overall abortion ban. The court is not going to consider that Idaho abortion ban, though, until April. And the law will be in effect until then. So Idaho doctors will have at least a few months now when they will have to decide between prison, five years in prison, and trying to save patients literally in the emergency room. The Biden campaign, I'm sure, would appreciate running on heart-rending issues like that. But instead, they are having to run on heart-rending issues like this. Eventually, it culminated... The, the, the long break, simmering break between he and myself in June of 2020 when he wanted to deploy active duty troops on the street of Washington, D.C., and, and suggested actually that we, we shoot American, um, uh, Americans in the streets. When he suggested that we shoot Americans in the streets. Trump's former defense secretary, Mark Esper. The differences between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are myriad and important. In a two-party system, each party, by definition, is really important, even when the party is occasionally a hot mess. But once one of those two parties is knowingly picking the shoot Americans in the street option, the violent overthrow of the government option, the dictatorship on day one option, it does get hard to talk about anything else. And so here we go. Iowa is a week from tonight. The Republican cause of their front-running candidate has already seen 1,200 people criminally charged, over 800 convicted or pled guilty, and their candidate himself facing 91 felonies. His Republican primary opponents, both Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, say they will pardon him if they are elected. And this, by definition, will have to be the grounds on which the entire contest is fought this year. Not because of one man, but because this is one whole party that has picked this as their cause. So here we go. 2024, be there. We'll be wild. The latest wave started on Christmas Day. Police and ambulances came screaming up to the home of the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. They were responding to a 911 call about a shooting inside her home. There had been no shooting inside her home. The call was a hoax. It was designed to provoke a scary and potentially dangerous police response. That same day, Christmas Day, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia also reported being the victim of a similar hoax 911 call. A couple days later, it was Florida U.S. Senator Rick Scott who had police called to his house for, again, a non-existent reported shooting. That same day, the same thing happened at the home of Georgia's Republican lieutenant governor. For good measure, a bomb threat was called into his office the next morning. Two days later, it was the Secretary of State of Maine. That call drew emergency responders to her home just, just a day after she announced she was barring Donald Trump from the state's ballot because of his role in the attack on Congress on January 6, 2021. The following day, December 30th, it was police swarming the home of California's lieutenant governor after a false report of a shooting at that home. That call came after California's lieutenant governor also called for Trump to be barred from California's ballot. 
Then last night, at about 10 o'clock, police and fire vehicles descended on the Washington home of the federal judge who was overseeing Trump's January 6th case in D.C. Once again, a fake report of a shooting had been called in. Nothing was amiss at the judge's home, but it provoked a massive and dangerous police response. It's called swatting. It's calling in fake emergencies to draw an armed police response, hopefully a SWAT team response, to somebody's home. Armed police rushing into what they believe is a very dangerous active shooter situation. It's always scary. It's always risky. It's something that has had fatal consequences in the past. And we right now are in the midst of a spree of swatting calls to state and federal officials, including judges. And in fact, on that score, we have some breaking news uh, for you tonight. NBC News is now reporting that it is not just the federal judge in Trump's federal January 6th case who has been attacked like this in recent days. It is also special counsel Jack Smith. We can now report Jack Smith was also the victim of an attempted swatting at his Washington area home on Christmas Day. Two law enforcement officials telling, excuse me, two law enforcement sources telling NBC News that someone called 911 that day reporting that Jack Smith had shot his wife at the address where Smith lives. Local police did dispatch units toward the home. They were called off when Deputy U.S. Marshals protecting Smith and his family told police it was a false alarm. No arrests have been made. A spokesperson for the special counsel's office is declining to comment. President Biden, um, I think, I don't know, but I think, um, not necessarily by his own choice, but by necessity, is focusing his campaign on threats to democracy. Uh, you very famously have made that case to the American public yourself in your role in impeachment in the January 6th investigation. What do you make of this as a strategic call by the president? I think it's born of necessity. We are at a really fragile point in the history of our country, in the history of our democracy. Uh, you talked uh, in your opening discussion about the state of our two-party system. In a two-party system, both parties need to have uh, relative health. They need to be healthy for the system to work. Um, I, I, I look forward to the day when the Republican Party is once again a home for people like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. But today, the Republican Party is in terribly ill health. Uh, and judged by that standard, our democracy is more vulnerable today than it was Three years ago, three years ago, we would be now two days from January 6th. And two days after those events, Republican leaders were repudiating Donald Trump. Uh, Kevin McCarthy was talking about his culpability. And you had Mitch McConnell around that time talking about there being remedies, i.e. prosecution for someone who engages in this kind of thing. Um, here we are three years later. The Republican Party is trying to completely reinvent those days and what what took place they have embraced him closer than ever he is worse than ever uh, they're describing both the president and and republican leaders like stefanik those who were arrested on that day as hostages as political prisoners well two days after the actual event they were not describing those who beat officers and gouged them and bear sprayed them and had members of congress running for their lives they weren't describing them as you know, political prisoners, those who were arrested uh, in that melee. But now they are. Um, in terms of its commitment to democracy, the Republican Party is way worse than it was on that day. Uh, and it's been a, a clear trajectory. Um, I often look to the canaries in the coal mine, and one of them for me was in 2016, not when Donald Trump was elected. Oh, that was a pretty compelling sign we were in trouble. But in North Carolina, on the same day when a Democratic governor was elected, and Republicans in North Carolina responded not by saying next time we're going to do better, not by saying we'll have better message or better policies or a better candidate, but by instead stripping the Democratic governor of his responsibilities. This is what the Republicans in the legislature did. That was an ethic that said it's no longer about democracy. It's no longer about free and fair elections. It's about if you lose, you try to change the rules of the game or, as we would see four years later, you try to overturn the result. Uh, or Democrats are inherently um, ineligible to hold power, and only Republicans can hold power. I mean, that to me was the lesson out of North Carolina, that your enemy, your political enemy, is not somebody who you try to beat in an election and whoever wins gets power. Your political enemy 
is not allowed to ever hold power, even if they win. And that's the end. Yes. Yes. Uh, if the other side wins, it is inherently illegitimate. Yeah.